that. But you want to meet him in the mall. Do you want this sin, this pain, this misery to continue on? Or do you want Jesus to finally put an end to it? He's not waiting looking at his clock going, ah, it's just not time yet. He's saying, I'm ready. But I love you too much to come before you're ready. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also, here's this word. It's a southern word. It's a good southern word. What's that word? I reckon. What are you to reckon? You are to reckon yourselves as dead to sin. What does that actually mean? Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, this is how you reckon yourself dead to sin, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to Him. You have been born again. You are a new creation. The old has passed, the new has come. This is what Christ wants to do. And the world says, yeah, we don't believe that. And so Christ hasn't come. But when a people are ready to say, Lord, we believe, please do this in me, then Christ will come. Do you guys understand that? We look and say, impossible. And the Bible says, with men it is impossible. But with God, what? All things are possible. This has everything to do with you holding the hand of your Savior and never letting it go. Because when you say, now this sin is, this, this, you don't know, this sin is too much. This temptation is too hard. What that means is you've let go of the grasp of your Savior. And you're now standing in your own power and you will never overcome anything. But if you hold on to the hand of Jesus Christ and He lives in your heart, if God is for you, does this really work? The choice is yours, brothers and sisters. We can give you the food. We can tell you week after week. And some will get it. Some will receive it with gladness. And others will say, no. It's too hard. I don't want to exert that kind of energy and force and power because it is your will that you control. And you have to decide day by day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Closing in this morning is number 125.
be, did God love Moses? Yes. Did God have a special relationship with Moses? Yes. And did Moses have a special relationship with God? Yes. Did God ever want to kill Moses? No. Yes. Did God ever want to kill Moses? And did he, if it wasn't for Moses' his wife, God would have slain him. Brothers and sisters, the reason why we have been giving you these sermons and these lessons and talking about victory in Jesus is because you need to understand how God views sin. He doesn't take it lightly. And what we have done is we have placed, we have taken God from here and we placed him on our level. And we're thinking that God is okay with my sin. And God is not okay with my sin. And God's not okay with your sin. Real quick, turn with me to Exodus. Chapter 4. You get home, study this whole chapter because God is talking to Moses, giving him instructions as he's sending him to go talk to Pharaoh. And he's telling him what to do. And he's telling him, this is what you should say. And in the middle of this, this event happens. And after this event is done, he goes right back to tell Moses what he needs to do. But you need to understand that Moses was... He, he didn't take God's word seriously no. before this point. Okay? And, and he thought that him and God were okay. So, Ricky, do you have that? What's the verse? It's Exodus chapter 4, verse 24 through 26. It's only two verses. 24 or through 26? Yeah, 24 through 26. And it came to pass on the way. This is the way that they're going from where he was at at Jethro's place, going to Egypt. What happened? At the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Sought to kill who? Moses. Right? God was going to slay Moses. And somebody stepped in. So keep reading. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the porcelain of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. When it says, so he let him go, is that where he capitalized? That's who, who's the he that let him go? God was going to slay him. Why? Because Moses was going to release God's people. And the covenant that God made with Abraham was shown through what? Circumcision. And Moses didn't circumcise his own kid. Does God take seriously His commands yes. and what He tells us? So on the way, Moses had to come to a better understanding of how holy and how just and how righteous God is. Now, isn't it funny that after it's done, their relationship goes right back to where it was? God does not take your sin lightly. Amen. And before Jesus can come, he has to be able to step out of the heavenly sanctuary. Is that right? And how is he ever going to get out of the heavenly sanctuary if our sins keep going up to the heavenly sanctuary? Because at some point, God's people are going to believe that he is their savior and he has come to save them from their sin, not in their sin. And they're going to trust him and they're going to walk according to all that he has commanded. And God will finally have a people that he can leave his high priestly garments and lay them to the side and finally come back as what? King, King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you realize that is the only reason why the Adventist church was raised up? The only reason. It wasn't so we could tell the world about the Sabbath. We didn't get this message. Or the world didn't get it from us. We got it from Seventh-day Baptists. Right? It is to prepare a people to meet Jesus Christ in life. So listen, let me close reading one poem. And I'm sure you've heard this before. Patty, can you play softly uh, in number 130? He was born in an 
obscure village, the child of the peasants. He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never, never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never lived in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when a tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his ex executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. I am well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as this one solitary life. Yeah. How many of you remember the name Napoleon? Do you know what Napoleon said about Jesus Christ? Napoleon was the Emperor of France and one of the greatest military commanders of all time. Napoleon knew about shaping history. Napoleon said, I know men and tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I founded empires on what, uh, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? It was upon force. They started empires through the use of force. Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of people would die for him. Everything in Christ astonishes me. His spirit overawes me, and his will <coughs> confounds me. I search in vain in history to find the similar to Jesus Christ or anything that can approach the gospel. That was Napoleon. If Napoleon was able to come to that conclusion. What should we, as God's last day, remnant people, what kind of people should we be? And what should the world see in us? Let us stand as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today, for the opportunity that we have to give our hearts fully and completely to you. Father, I am also thankful and grateful that you allow us to live in a country where we're still free to worship you, that we can open your word, that we can share the gospel with those that we meet. But Father, in my lifetime, I've seen a change, and I've seen the freedoms that I had when I was a child. I don't have them no more. And I know what's going to happen in the future. Father, what I pray is that you will forgive my sins, that you will change this fallen nature of mine and allow me to live in the Spirit that I may show the world who Jesus Christ is. But Father, not just me, but I pray for all of your people who are here this morning that you will change us. Father, you took Jesus and he took 12 men and they changed the world. We have 60 or more people here today. Father, we want to do the same thing. But I also know that that will never happen unless we really become slaves to you. Father, help us to put away our wills to do what we want and help us to seek your will. 
and to submit to your authority and to be changed by your spirit. Father, I pray that you use us to bring this last day message to this world so that Jesus can come back and we can finally go home. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.